Namaskar. In this video lecture, I'm going to present uh, a talk on uh, CRISPR-Cas as a gene editing tool uh, for the refresher course in chemistry at Ranchi University. This CRISPR-Cas uh, was a very burning topic these days and these two ladies uh, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, they won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2020 for this discovery. So let's begin our lecture. This lecture will be divided into, in fact, there are two lectures for this uh, refresher course on this topic. One is on the general about the CRISPR-Cas as a whole. That will in fact uh, be divided into two parts, part one. This will give a brief idea about the gene expression and part two, it will deal about the historical development of CRISPR-Cas9 system as a gene editing tool. And it, it will also include uh, the mechanism how CRISPR-Cas9 system works. The lecture two will consist of this part three which deals about the applications of this CRISPR-Cas9. So let's begin. Part one, let me give a brief idea about gene expression. And this is particularly for people who are not from biology background. Uh, maybe chemistry is also very allied to biology. So you might be knowing this, though let us have a recapitulation of this. You know, all organisms are made up of cells and cells contain chromosomes within their nuclei and these chromosomes are comprised of uh, DNA and proteins. The protein, proteins are the structural element that, uh, that hold this DNA, DNA double helix into a very compacted manner in the chromosome. The genetic element is the DNA which is of course double helical structure as you can see like this. It comprises of four uh, nitrogenous bases, four letters that we call TACG, thymine, guanine, cytosine and adenine. And the complementarity is like this that T will hybridize with A and G will hybridize with C. T with double hydrogen bonds, two hydrogen bonds uh, and G and C will for, uh, hybridize with three hydrogen bonds. The DNA it is not that the entire DNA is, is gene. The entire DNA uh, does not comprise the gene. Genes are only small portions of the DNA, of the whole set of uh, uh, chromosomes and DNA that is present in an organism. It is not that the entire DNA sequence is gene. Certain part of the DNA is only gene. For example, if you talk about human genome, only 3%, even less than 3% of the total DNA, there are 3 million base pairs of DNA that is present in human genome, only 3% of that is gene. And rest 97% uh, is not, not a gene. But it has got some other functions, but it is not a gene. It is uh, responsible for, earlier it was known to be a junk DNA. Uh, but uh, recently there are a lot of functions coming out of this uh, non-genic area. So uh, if you see the comp complementarity, it is like this, that DNA have two ends, as you know, five prime and three prime. So if you, if one of these strand is like this, A, C, G, C, T, G, A, C, T, G, uh, the opposite strand will be the anti-parallel. So it will begin with three prime and it will contain T against A, G against C, C against G, G against C, T, A against T, like that. So this is the complementarity of uh, double strand of a DNA molecule. So when transcription occurs, an RNA molecule is synthesized from DNA. And one of the, these two strands acts as a template. The other strand will be our template strand. So if this is the template strand, the RNA molecule that will be synthesized will have a sequence uh, like this, A against T, C against G, G against C, C against G, but U against A. So basically the complementarity is same for RNA and DNA. 
uh, the only difference is that the thymine is replaced by uracil in in RNA so these are some basic things we should keep in mind while going through this uh, CRISPR Cas9 mechanism and other things so how gene expression occurs so the genes are present in the DNA so they are first transcribed in the form of an RNA so as we saw that the sequence of the RNA is same as that of the DNA uh, except that the thymine is replaced by the uracil in RNA and this RNA will will finally be translated into protein proteins are made up of amino acids as you know and each amino acid is coded by or designated by three nucleotides in the RNA so each of these three nucleotides in the RNA will code for an for an amino acids amino acid that means uh, if an RNA comprises of say 150 nucleotides it will make a protein uh, having 50 amino acids 5 into 3 15 to 3 150 so these three nucleotides each of the three nucleotides in the RNA are called genetic code so this triplet genetic code is triplet in nature that we say this is the thing where so, so each of these three nucleotide is a genetic code so since the sequence of RNA is same as that of the sequence in the DNA so I, we can say that the, the DNA the gene also contains the genetic code so each of these three nucleotide sequences present in the DNA uh, will designate a particular amino acid uh, present in the protein proteins are the final form of, of of a gene expression and they determine the character the phenotype that we show uh, is dependent on the protein proteins are of two types mainly one is structural that make our body and the other is functional those enzymes that actually do the biochemical reactions and our phenotype is dependent on those biochemical reactions so proteins are basically the final form which which are expressed and they produce our phenotypic characters of different types so genes are finally expressed in the form of protein that we can say this is the codon dictionary it was uh, deciphered in 1970s by uh, Okowa, Nirenberg and Korana that there are 64 genetic codes three of them are stop codons these are UAA UAG and UGA these are the stop codons where protein synthesis will stop and there is a start codon AUG in most of the organisms in most of the cells so and other uh, codons they represent uh, different different amino acids and you can see there are more than one codons for a particular amino acid this condition is called codon degeneracy so we will not go into the details of these things but the basic thing is this that for a particular amino acid there are three nucleotide sequences responsible for so those are called genetic code so now if you if you change this uh, any of these genetic codes say UCU it codes for serine if you change the U to say uh, if you change this U to C then what will happen U C U will be converted into C C U and C C U codes for what C C U codes for proline so that particular codon instead of coding for serine will code for proline similarly if you change this C to G it will be converted into U G U U G U codes for what U G U codes for you can go to this yeah UGU codes for cysteine so a serine will be converted into a cysteine like this so this is called mutation or editing that you can do that if you want to change a particular amino acid of a particular protein you have you can change the genetic code of that particular amino acid present in the DNA that will result in the change of that amino acid in the protein and if that amino acid is an uh, important amino acid in the protein structure it determines the protein structure or it is present in the active side of the enzyme it will alter the function of the protein 
and you will get the desired result whatever you want to get so this is how it works now let us talk about the second part that is crispr cas9 what is this crispr cas9 is the uh, full form of crispr a it goes like this it is uh, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats a very long and jugglery term very difficult to pronounce and and to remember but each of these uh, words have a separate meaning let us first go by this uh, palindrome or palindromic repeats short palindromic re repeats short means small sized about 20 nucleotide or maybe 20 to 40 base pairs long repeats mean it is repeated several times tandemly means one after another there is no word tandemly over here but they are tandemly repeated just like the horses are present in in a uh, in a cart so so the so it is a short repeat and it is palindromic what does palindromic means palindromic uh, uh, sentences or words uh, are are arranged in such a way that they read same from both ends so in case of dna say this is a palindromic sequence if you if one of these strand it reads like pi prime t t c c c c n n g g g g a a 3 prime the opposite strand will also read the same pi prime t t c c c c n n g g g g a a 3 prime you see this way and this way the sequence is absolutely same so this will be called a palindrome so if it is present in a repeated fashion it will be called palindromic repeats hmm. and there are several such repeats present uh, in the dna of a bacterial genome and they are interspaced another word interspaced these palindromic repeats are not continuous there there are interspacer dna elements uh, they are interrupting uh, between each of these palindromic repeats so what are these interspacer dna elements that we will talk later and they are not uh, this interspacer dna element are not uh, si not similar sequences each of the interspacer dna elements are different from the other and they are clustered in the chromosome in a regular fashion that's why it is called clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats crispr and cas stands for crispr associated gene so there is another set of gene which is present just uh, in the upstream region of this crispr ele element so if you notice here uh, there are uh, several these these structures this one this one this one and this one there are four these are palindromic repeats they are same sequences present uh, after a certain gap those gaps are represented by the interspaced dna elements so this entire area con uh, consisting of the palindromic repeats and the interspaced dna element comprise the crispr and this particular gene uh, there are number of genes over here three or four they comprise the crispr associated gene both both these uh, crispr and cas are required for the purpose of gene ed editing that we will see a little later and this system is present in the bacterial chromosome in fact all the bacteria not all we will see that in the historical development that most bacteria otherwise i should say poses this uh, crispr element and the cas element for the purpose of uh, restricting the entry of a phage dna so basically it is an immune system we will see that later on so the crispr cas9 that has been designed by doudna and emmanuel charpentier is is this one this is the final structure we will go back and see how this structure was developed crispr cas9 is basically an rna guided endonuclease so here is the rna molecule that is being present and this structure this big structure is the cas enzyme 
the nucleus casp is basically a nucleus enzyme that clips the nucleic acid it makes a double strand cleavage in the nucleus so these are the scissors or the sites you can say the scissors present the molecular scissors in fact present in the cas9 enzyme that introduce cuts at this position in the dna this is a double stranded dna that has been uh, unwinded here and hybridized with the guide rna the particular the rna is called the guide rna single guide rna rather so it is a nuclease enzyme which is guided by this rna that where it will bind this rna guides the nuclease to find the position in the dna where uh, it will bind and it will introduce the cut and once it introduces a cut uh, when the dna will will be repaired all the cells have a repair system when you introduce a cut the cell uh, induces those repair system uh, so that the dna gets sealed again so when it it will try to repair itself it will make mistakes and those mistakes are crucial for the development of mutants that we will see here we will make the changes once it creates a, a digestion in the dna you get a, a you get a position or you get a chance to modify that area of the dna that we will see how so basically crispr cas9 is an rna guided endonucleus it is an rnp ribonucleoprotein the protein is the enzyme that can cleave nucleic acids from inside endo means inside that has the capacity to identify its target dna with the help of the guide rna it identifies the target dna because this complementary sequence that you introduce here will hybridize with the complementary region of the target dna and interestingly you can program this sequence where it has to bind you can program this you can change this sequence so that it finds the right position in the chromosome in the dna where you actually want the change to occur okay and it makes a very precise cut in the desired position in the dna and after that when it uh, repairs it introduces changes now let us see the historical development of crispr cas9 system as a gene editing tool this is very interesting interesting story and in fact uh, it is motivational also that how a scientist how in fact uh, two scientists and their associates of course they think about a particular uh, topic which was uh, which was very much different which was uh, nothing to do it has nothing to do uh, at that time when people saw it they never thought that this will develop into a such an exciting tool which can make several changes um, in the car in in future it will change the entire scenario of uh, medicine as well as uh, therapy as well as crop development and many many more things so the story begins uh, from 1987 1987 if you think a little bit if you go back uh, it was only 10 years since uh, the first dns was sequenced by frederick sanger uh, in 1977 maxim and gilbert they also developed as a sequencing method chemical Uh, digestion sequencing method in 1977 and sanger also developed a, another method enzymatic method which was more simpler uh, that is called uh, sanger's dideoxy chain termination method so it was only merely 10 years has surpassed and in 1987 uh, within those, those 10 years uh, many scientists have cloned their genes and different genes and they have sequenced their, uh, those genes and the molecular biology genetic engineering was developing uh, it was in the juvenile stage you can say at that moment so this was the first evidence uh, of crispr uh, but nothing was known uh, what happened in an e coli escherichia coli strain when uh, Ish ishino and and his group were sequencing a particular gene called IAP an alkaline phosphatase gene an isozyme for that gene when they sequenced they found a 3 prime uh, in the 3 prime untranslated region they found uh, this 
CRISPR like and that we are calling now CRISPR it was known nothing at that time so in their discussion part in the paper they say that along with this IAP gene we are finding uh, a piece of DNA <coughs> where where as palindromic sequences are present in a repeated fashion and they are interspaced by a small uh, maybe about 40 base pair long DNA sequences. What are these uh, repeated elements are doing here? We are not uh, we are not able to say anything about that. Nothing is known about that. But this is present and this says something which we need to uh, we need need to know in future. So you can say this was the first evidence of CRISPR Cas. Then in 1993, similar sequences were observed in uh, in an archaea. Archaea is an archaebacteria. Uh, you know there are in fact uh, the prokaryotic organisms that we say uh, prokaryotes are the the very simpler organisms which do not have a nucleus their genetic material DNA it DNA is the chromosome and that that is present uh, in the cytoplasm um, naked in the cytoplasm there is no nuclear boundary uh, of these prokaryotic cells. The prokaryotic uh, organisms can be divided into two kingdoms. One is called the bacteria and the other is called the archaea. So archaea are one type of, uh, you can say this is a, nowadays it is being considered as a super kingdom in fact. The bacteria and the archaea and eukarya, there are three super kingdoms also called domains. So archaebacteria in, uh, are responsible for, uh, they, they live in in extreme conditions so they are called extremophiles and they are thought to be the uh, progenitors of uh, of all living organisms probably the life originated from one or the other type of archaebacteria that originated way back sometime in maybe 380 billion uh, 380 million uh, 3800 million it will be I think 3.8 billion years ago okay 3800 million years ago uh, some archaebacteria has had started the journey of living system on this globe so little bit of introduction about archaea so uh, this similar sequence was found again in Halophyrax mediterranean and archaea and after that it was the period of uh, 1992 to 2000 and later on still now uh, it's a period period of genome sequencing genome comparison a number of uh, organisms uh, starting from uh, human being genome to drosophila to to rice genome to arabidopsis genome uh, in fact and several other bacteria like the escherichia coli the haemophilus influenzae the bacillus subtilis and several other protozoa like the trypanosomes and the mm, the leishmania toxoplasma there are these g organisms the sequence of their genome was determined during that period whole genome sequencing was in uh, is was going on and uh, and uh, several whole genome sequences were available in the database. So when scientists compared those genome sequences, they found that 40% uh, of the bacteria and almost 100% uh, of the archaea have such uh, regular repeats, CRISPR-like regular repeats. It was not uh, designated as CRISPR at that time. It is the developmental stages that we are talking about how people are gradually coming to know that this kind of a sequence is present in most of the bacteria, most of the archaea. So what they are, what this sequence is trying to say, we know that if something is, uh, is present in a regular fashion, in a pattern, it has some information. So scientists were thinking what these uh, sequences are doing in the chromosome in the bacterial and the archaeal chromosome. In 2002, Janssen et al, uh, they found the Cas element, the associated DNA sequence that is called Cas, CRISPR associated. And he, he was the first person, in fact, to coin the term CRISPR. 
in in this paper in 2002 what uh, jensen published uh, in that paper they called this particular sequence element which was called in a several different manner that repeated sequences etc etc so first time it was given this terminology crispr cluster uh, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats and the associated gene that was uh, that was not revealed till 2002 was now sh uh, being seen by this jensen and his group that there is yet another sequence that is called cas and cas is present always wherever there is a crispr at the upstream there is a cas element so these two things are doing something important in the bacterial cell that was uh, the story was uh, mysterious till then and in 2005 uh three back to back papers by three different groups mojica bolotin and pausels groups uh, established that the the spacer dna in the crispr in the crispr uh, element this the interspacer region that we are talking about that spacer dna is is of foreign origin it is not a bacterial origin what does that mean foreign origin means it comes from certain bacteriophage or some plasmid what are bacteriophages bacteriophages are viruses that that can infect a bacterium and can destroy that that bacterium by lysis phage means eating that means bacteria eating viruses are called bacteriophages and what are plasmids plasmids are also uh, a kind of a extra chromosomal dna uh, elements present in some bacteria not all bacteria so these are the plasmid is also is an external material you can say it has come from somewhere some other uh, organisms dna element so it has its own uh, both phage and plasmids they have their own origin of replication so that's why they can replicate in the in the bacterial cell independently independent of the bacterial chromosome so they are of external origin you can say so these interspacer dna elements that were present uh, between each of the repeats are of foreign origin this was uh, discovered in 2005 by three different groups in three different papers and this is the uh, this particular foreign dna element of phage and plasmid uh, is a part of the adaptive immunity in the bacterial system the bacteria in fact it saves this the, the dna element of the phage or the plasmid in this crispr region to remember the that the phage had attacked the the bacteria uh, previously and if the same phage attacks the same bacterium once again it will identify it will recognize that phage with the help of this saved dna uh, snippet that has been uh, kept stored in the crispr element and with the help of that the host cell will identify the incoming phage dna and if it matches with the phage dna if this saved dna is same as that of the freshly coming phage dna it will destroy that phage dna with the help of the cas enzyme so basically it's a immune system adaptive immune system present in the bacterial cell more or less uh, similar to the immunological memory and surveillance that we are having we human being or other uh, vertebrate systems have like you are being vaccinated nowadays by covid-19 uh, sars cov 2 virus different kinds of vaccine you are receiving vaccines are basically the antigens in fact the antigen is also a very small portion of the entire virus uh, and and that contains the part of the uh, antigen that is introduced into your body is is called epitop this epitop is a very small segment maybe 6 to 10 amino acid long protein that is good enough for triggering an immunological response so scientists have identified that which part of the virus is actually the epitop and if you take that if you chemically synthesize or you destroy the virus and it you purify that particular uh, epitop region and you introduce that in your body 
it will act similar to that of the virus it will trigger your immune system in more or less similar way but it will not replicate because it is not a virus so it does not contain the rna and the rna vi rna vaccines that are being introduced that also are incomplete rna that will make only that epitopic region a little bit more of that protein so it does not contain the other portions of the virus so it will not make a complete virus it will only synthesize as we saw that the central dogma that the rna are finally translated into proteins so the rna vaccine will finally get translated into protein in our cells and those proteins will be the antigen and then they will trigger our immune response our memory of the immune response so when the real virus will attack us the immune memory immunological memory will be able to identify that virus and will produce more and more amount of antibodies and t cells to destroy that uh, newly coming virus so this is the the story of crispr cas that was developing in 2005 people came to know okay this is a adaptive immune system of a bacterial of a bacterium or an archaea so now here comes the entry of uh, jennifer doudna 2006 doudna entered the field of crispr and she was introduced by uh, another scientist uh, uh, named jill banfield here is the story is very interesting jill banfield uh, was a geo microbiologist means a soil microbiologist in in university of california okla berkeley and doudna has just joined this uh, berkeley okla university uh, in 2006 maybe the previous year and she was in fact uh, was not working in the field of crispr she never heard about crispr at that time so it was jill banfield who actually introduce uh, doudna with this terminology crispr doudna and uh, jill, jill jill banfield uh, she was uh, interested to uh, to learn about crispr and she talked about she was searching someone uh, who was an expert of uh, rna interference and 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 is present in this berkeley okla university so that she can collaborate with with her so that's why when she was doing she was uh, searching this in google that berkeley uh, rna interference then she found the name of the doudna that she is a newly joined scientist in okla so she dialed her and he she described her over phone and Uh, about this crispr doudna got excited uh, about the thing and uh, she and both of them they came on, on this uh, cafe cafeteria in the in the the canteen of the okla university where they discussed uh, about this crispr cas9 crispr system not cas9 yet uh, till uh, at that time nothing was known about the different forms of cas cas1 2 3 etc etc so doudna was uh, doudna got introduced to, to this matter in 2006 only and in 2012 within 6 years of period she developed this tool a uh, beautiful tool of gene editing uh, with the help of uh, her colleagues and uh, jill banfield herself and several other fellows and also of course the other one uh, emmanuel charpentier she was also fascinating so uh, if you want to know more about these uh, stories you can go to the for this book a crack in creation so the first application of crispr cas uh, not as a gene editing tool uh, happened to be in 2007 when crispr cas was first applied to attain phage immunity in streptococcus thermophilus streptococcus thermophilus uh, is the bacterium that is used for yogurt production it is a economically uh, very important bacterium it is a fermentative bacterium that ferments milk to yogurt and so it is very important but uh, the the particular company that was producing this yogurt using this streptococcus thermophilus a danish company 
uh, that was suffering from this problem that these these bacteria were attacked by certain kind of phage and so uh, the culture got destroyed because of the phage attack and the yield of yogurt got affected so they were in a search of certain kind of solution so that a uh, certain kind of strain that will be phage resistant so what they did uh, they cultured these phages and the bacterium streptococcus thermophilus the log phage of the bacterium and the phage pap1 they mixed them together and the phage lysates were then plated in lb agar plate and some of the colonies grew most of these were lysed out here but some of them were living and so when they were uh, grown in petri plates agar plates some of them were were found to grow so definitely they were resistant to these phages okay so these two strains they were obtained picked up from there and they were purified they were further cultured and in their stationary phase when this their dna was sequenced it was found that um, a new piece of dna has has been uh, incorporated in the crispr area this is the dna sequence uh, of the crispr area of of this bacterium which has yet not been exposed to the phage and this one is the crispr element of of this this bacteria which have been uh, found to be resistant in in this culture so this uh, dna element shows an extra piece of sequence and when this uh, compared this sequence is with the phage dna sequence they found that yeah this is the phage this is this piece of dna is in fact the the particular dna of the phage it's a small piece of that the phage dna that has been incorporated to here over here so here comes the first evidence that okay the phage dna gets in fact uh, gets incorporated in the clustered area so these uh, all these colored regions uh, are the phage dna that have uh got incorporated and they are of different phages uh, the organism remembers with the help of this dna that this particular phage has once infected me so if the same phage again infects me i will identify with the help of these elements that okay you have come again i will destroy you with the help of the cas enzyme so these are the interspacer element you can also call uh protospacer element protospacer is the uh the dna that the phage delivers in the cell that is protospacer uh, and particular region that will will get incorporated in the cl clustered area is the protospacer and when it gets incorporated it is it is called interspacer and this diamond shaped these regions are uh, short palindromic repeats okay now i think you are getting the matter that how crispr uh, cas element uh, work in a system now there are several question in the mind uh, of doudna as well as uh, her colleagues that how the phage dna snippet uh, gets incorporated in the bacterial genome how the crispr dna transcribed is transcribed and processed into small pieces of uh, those hairpin looped rna how is the target dna recognized and is and is destroyed and how we can use this knowledge for our for human purpose or or crop improvement or other things how we can use this as a maybe you can say as a gene editing tool can this be used as a gene editing tool if it does recognize a particular target sequence of dna and destroys it specifically so these were many questions that were unanswered till 2007 even though the first evidence of uh, crispr and its uh, applicability has come out so doudna entered this field and with the collaboration with uh, uh, jill banfield and other fellows uh, there were two back to back papers in 2009 and 2010 one in in structure and the other one is in science uh, they published about this 
CRISPR Cas, uh, the postdoc fellow known Black was very important, uh, and Doudna also collaborated with uh, another lab called John Van der Roost's lab, and they deciphered in this paper they have de talked about uh, the Cas enzyme. There are three types of Cas enzyme actually. They they came to understand that that are involved in the process. Those are called Cas1, Cas6, and Cas3. And how the story, the question, the answer of the questions that we uh, we saw a little while ago uh, that were coming in the minds of uh, Doudna and Woost and others uh, was now a little bit of that was revealed by this this uh, research work. So the bacteriophage, when it attacks the bacterium, it delivers its DNA, and it is uh, chopped into pieces by the enzyme Cas1. So Cas1, it removes the protospacer. This is the protospacer DNA, and uh, it incorporates into the CRISPR cluster, CRISPR locus, you can say. So each of these uh, boxes are uh, are protospacer from one or the other fudge DNA. So it gets incorporated into the uh, CRISPR locus now. The Cas gene is present just beside it. Now uh, it is transcribed, the entire CRISPR locus is transcribed as a pre-CRISPR RNA, a long molecule. And then Cas6 enzyme, the product of gene CSY4, it uh, clips these uh, repeated elements along with the separate uh, spacer interspacer elements those are those are different th those are distinct for a particular virus but these looped areas are similar so uh, each of these uh, repeated as well as the spacer elements are separated by the cas6 enzyme like this and of course one of these is complementary to this dna so if the same phage will attack the vir uh, bacterium again, it will introduce its DNA. And with the help of uh, one of these, which one? The one that is produced from this particular piece of DNA, will, will associate with another enzyme, the product of this particular uh, cluster of genes, that is called Cas3, that will associate with that and will recognize the DNA, the protospacer DNA, of the patch, the same patch that has attacked earlier and will destroy it with the help of the nucleus activity of the Cas3 enzyme. So this was called to be uh, type 1 CRISPR-Cas system. But it the problem with this system was this, that this Cas3 enzyme was very, very complex. It was in fact a multi-subunit protein maybe about 9 to 10 or more subunits of uh, polypeptides were involved to to make this process, to accomplish this process of interference. So this made the system a little bit more complicated. And both these papers, uh, they, they uh, Doudna and Oost, they, they worked in the with the bacterium Escherichia coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. These were the two bacteria that they were working on. Here comes the entry of uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, the other scientist who was working in uh, in France. And she was working with uh, another bacterium, a very dangerous bacterium, Streptococcus pyogenes. Uh, Streptococcus thermophilus phil uh, was the one that was first applied for, uh, for, for phage immunity. Uh, in 2007 and this was a uh, sister of that you can say uh, that bacterium streptococcus pyogenes but it was a infectious bacterium it causes uh, it was a flesh eating bacterium so it was a dangerous bacterium and she was working on that bacterium and on the same thing crispr uh, cas system and she published the, uh, her uh, work in this reputed journal Nature in 2011, CRISPR RNA maturation by RNA by trans encoded small RNA and host factor RNAs3. What is this? What she was talking about? Jennifer uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, 
Emmanuel Charpentier, who was working in Streptococcus pyogenes, she found that in this system, Streptococcus pyogenes, this is the bacterium Streptococcus pyogenes, and here is the uh, CRISPR locus with a leader sequence. There is a Cas, uh, there are several Cas genes over here, and in this system, there is yet another piece of DNA that is called TransCRISPR locus from where another RNA transcriptor RNA is synthesized. So this was a little bit different from the one that uh, Doudna and her group obtained. They did not see something like transcriptor RNA. But their protein was uh, more complicated. The enzyme that cleaved the target DNA, protospacer DNA, that was complicated. But here the Cas9 enzyme the Cas9 enzyme, that is the nucleus that, that clips the DNA, target DNA, was a single polypeptide. This was the good news for this bacterium. And the other mechanism was quite similar that the entire CRISPR locus was transcribed uh, together and then that was clipped into pieces and, and the pre-CRISPR RNA. Uh, this transcriptor RNA associated with all the CRISPR regions of the uh, of the pre-CRISPR RNA before the cleavage occurs. So this CRISPR and trans-CRISPR RNA, they hybridize together. So there are two RNA molecules over here, the CRISPR RNA and trans-CRISPR RNA. The CRISPR RNA also contains this, uh, the interspacer region that is specific for the particular target DNA or the protospacer DNA, you can say. So this was much simpler than the, the Doudna's uh, CRISPR-Cas system. Here the uh, complexity was in the RNA, there were two RNA molecules instead of DNA. In Doudna's case, uh, it, the complexity was in the protein, where the Cas3 enzyme was comp uh, uh, comprised of many polypeptides, but the RNA was a single molecule. So that was uh, in fact more complex than this one. So now what happened? Uh, but how did this, uh, this was called type 2 system. The Doudna's one was called type 1 system of CRISPR-Cas. This is called type 2 system. And there is another type 3 system which uh, works on RNA. We will not talk about that here. So this type 2 system destroyed the target DNA. How this destroyed was a little bit mysterious till then. Uh, this was up to this it was known but uh, this particular Cas9 enzyme was not yet cloned and it, it was not yet characterized. So it was uh, it was needed to be characterized. So uh, luckily in 2011 uh, in a conference at Puerto Rico, uh, both of these scientists, uh, Doudna and Jennifer uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, they came to meet each other and they went into a collaboration that resulted into this epoch-making discovery uh, published in Science in 2012, a programmable dual RNA guided DNA endonuclease in adaptive bacterial immunity. So this was the paper where we finally got, they finally got the gene editing tool about which they are programmable, programmable dual RNA guided. Till now it was a dual RNA, trans-CRISPR and CRISPR RNA. But in the next few days or years, uh, in fact few days, uh, Doudna's group was capable of, uh, of uh, combining these two RNA molecules, CRISPR and the trans-CRISPR RNA molecules, together with a piece of an oligo ribonucleotide and converting into a single molecule that was called the single guide RNA. So it becomes even more simpler. Now you have a single guide RNA and that is customizable that you can change the particular interspacer region uh, 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 with your will, uh, whatever you desired, whatever sequence you want, you can change this 20 nucleotide uh, sequence of the spacer element and the rest of the part that is the tr trans CRISPR and the CRISPR region uh, they have been united together joined together with the piece of the RNA molecule making it a single standard single guide RNA molecule making it much simpler now you have an RNA molecule and a single polypeptide enzyme 
and nucleus, endonucleus. So you make a RNP complex with a particular RNA that is programmable along with this particular protein and you introduce this into a cell and it will find the target DNA in the cell and it, it, it will introduce double strand break in the target DNA. So here is your uh, gene targeting or you can say gene editing tool ready to play with. Okay, so this was the historical development that I wanted to talk about the how a bacterial immunological system which was uh, uh, initially was uh, found in, in Escherichia coli then in several different archaea uh, and it was recognized by a soil microbiologist that this kind of system is there. So a simple bacterial uh, immunological system evolved into a gene editing tool like this. It was quite amazing. So what was the story b before this gene editing with CRISPR-Cas9? In the early developmental stages of genome editing, to induce the desired double strand breaks at a particular DNA target site, there were two nucleases systems available. One is called gene finger nucleus, the other is called transcription activator like effector nucleus, talens. So this zinc finger nucleus and talons, both of them were protein-based systems. They were proteins, complex of proteins in fact, that, that till then it was known that to find a particular target on a protein, uh, on, on, on a DNA, you, you have uh, different types of proteins, the transcription factors that bind on the protein, uh, different, when the transcription occurs, different types of protein subunits come in and associate with the DNA. So uh, if you engineer those proteins so that they, they can bind with the desired sequence of DNA and if those proteins are also associated with some nuclease activity, they will introduce cut on the desired places. So it was basically protein engineering. So it was uh, a little bit more complicated and uh, more uh, I mean costlier affair to use this more complex affair to do use talons. Stalin was uh, more specific than the ZFN zinc finger uh, motifs are the motifs that bind with the nucleic acid sequences so if you change this the motif uh, in a particular way changing the genetic code uh, the amino acid sequence of the pro of the protein will change and it will recognize a uh, a particular sequence of DNA and it will introduce a cut over there. So this is the how the ZFN and also the Talon uh, work. So despite their successful uses, uh, designing an expression system with this ZFN and Talon was very very difficult task. Mm, and and so in, in comparison to the clustered regularly interspersed short palindromic repeats, that is CRISPR, and the Cas9 nucleus, uh, it was which is a very much easier and robust gene editing platform. These were very very uh, complex system. This system can be efficiently programmed, the CRISPR Cas9, but that one, the ZFN and Talon, which was protein based sequence. If you uh, want to make a system, a particular Talon system, to bind with a particular target DNA, then you have to understand. You have to clone different. Uh, uh, segments of DNA uh, in the expression vector so that a kind of a protein is generated which will recognize that particular DNA. So it is a difficult task. You, here is the system it has been shown that this is the ZFN system. This ZFN protein it recognizes, it recognizes a particular sequence in the DNA uh, and it, will, it, it introduces a double strand break with the help of this nucleus. The, FOC1 domain of, of a particular bacterium. It introduces a double strand break over here and then the thing is similar that this double strand break will go uh, for repair and it will introduce uh, errors over there and if you allow a certain donor DNA uh, for homologous repair it will also uh, repair in a correct manner and it will 
uh, incorporate the desired sequence that you want same is the case with the talent but talent was more specific as it contained more number of uh, repeated uh, protein elements that can hybridize that can bind with a longer uh, sequence of dna so you can see if you want these proteins to bind with the DNA, you have to alter the protein sequence so that it recognizes a particular substrate, the DNA sequence as a substrate. So this is difficult task to, to engineer a protein than to engineer an RNA or to DNA. So this CAS, CRISPR-Cas system, it was simply an RNA molecule that helps you to recognize the DNA. So working with the RNA molecule is very very much simpler than the protein molecule. Here you don't need to clone the particular RNA in fact you can synthesize this. Nowadays uh, short nucleotide synthesis, synthesis is a very common thing. So you can synthesize this particular 20 base pair long sequence uh, 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 as per your uh, desire as per your target DNA that you want to uh, make changes in. And you can uh, combine that with the Cas9 uh, enzyme. We will see how it is done. What are the strategies for that uh, very soon uh, in the next few slides. So here this slide shows about the, the vectors uh, that are used for the transfer of the CRISPR-Cas system into, the, into a particular host uh, organism. Here we are talking about human. In plants, it is much simpler. In human, you must be thinking that a full-grown human, uh, how we can take the cell and in which cell and which particular tissue we can make these changes. So, as you know, if you are working with the embryonic stem cells, uh, the whole organism will get changed. If you um, make some change in the embryonic ES stem cells, that is at the embryonic stage, you are going to get an organism with a lot of uh, tissues being uh, changed, genetically modified. But in a full grown organism, what you can do, you can do, there are two strategies. One is if you want to make some change in vivo, Okay, that means within the patient's uh, or body in a particular tissue or you can have an in vitro or ex vivo rather, not in vitro, ex vivo that you isolate a particular tissue cells and then you modify those cells, you edit the, the gene, gene of the, those cells and you proliferate them and again you introduce them into the uh, human body. So this is called ex vivo. The ex vivo is uh, is comparatively simpler. Here you can get, uh, we know that the, in a full grown organism, human body, uh, there are some uh, pluripotent stem cells. There are some stem cells which are not completely potent. The blood cells that originate in the bone marrow they are pluripotent stem cells so those stem cells uh, are progenitor cells they give rise to several different types of blood cells like the rbcs the blood platelets the wbcs the lymphocytes and the t cell b cell nk cells the monocytes the macrophages etc all those types of cells originate from the the stem cell present in the bone marrow and it is all the time in a full grown organism they are originating in the bone marrow and differentiating into different types of cells. I will not talk about the progenitor, how it develops and how, not about the immune system here. So this is one way you can uh, isolate the stem cells and then you can modify and you can put the back, put them back in after the modification is over. Or you can use some vector, the viral vectors uh, with the help. Like this, you are using the Covishield. Covishield is a uh, is a vaccine is an adenovirus based vaccine the coronavirus dna has been introduced in the covid shield and that co that co virus as um, adenovirus in an adenovirus uh, the, and that virus acts as a carrier or vector for the dna of th of the uh, coronavirus so it will not cause any disease like the coronavirus but it will incorporate the dna in our uh, body cells and that will transcribe the RNA and will produce the protein that will act as an antigen and will trigger our immune system. That is the strategy for the Covishield. Similarly, if you want to introduce certain uh, RNA 
or DNA. You, you can use this adenovirus or the lentivirus and there are several others like this uh, liposomes, uh, the cationic liposomes, membrane bound vesicles uh, within which you can put your RNA and protein and you can these membrane bound vesicles uh, if you inject them they will fuse with the plasma membrane of the cells and they will deliver the whatever cargo you have put inside so this is one way of doing transferring the DNA or the RNA here we are talking about the RNA uh, and the protein element into this particular cell okay so this is how uh, the CRISPR element uh, is transferred into our body. So, if you are taking a particular cell and trying to introduce the CRISPR system, you can use two to three different strategies. You can transfer the particular DNA uh, for that particular RNA that will, this plasmid, this is the plasmid, there are two plasmids over here. One of the plasmid contains the homologous DNA where you might want to make the change uh, this 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 particular DNA sequence is the right DNA sequence it is the correct sequence so this you can call this as a donor DNA okay and this is the genome the chromosome and this particular region of the chromosome that you want to change according to this donor DNA the sequence of this homologous DNA will guide uh, the changes that you are trying to incorporate you want this DNA segment to be like this so that's why you have put this homologous DNA inside so that a homologous DNA dependent repair system uh, repairs this DNA according to the sequence of this particular donor homologous DNA the endonuclease system that is the crispr cas9 system that you have introduced with the uh, in the form of another plasmid that contains the gene for the single guide rna uh, and also the cas9 so this will this will transcribe into single guide rna and this will finally be translated into cas9 protein and they will assemble together and they they will find the target dna and with the help of this homologous donor dna they will make certain change over here which you can uh, elaborate with in, in this bigger picture you can see how it occurs so this is the place of the DNA in the target uh, double standard DNA that the CRISPR Cas has hybridized or found out with the help of this spacer DNA 20 nucleotide programmable uh, that has been produced from here the single guide RNA that is present in the plasmid so it will make a, a double strand break over here as you can see and when this break will be repaired there are two things that can happen one is this this repair can go for the non homologous end joining repair or it can go for the homology directed DNA repair so in this case the the homologous DNA that you have introduced the donor DNA that will help this uh, uh, broken DNA element to repair uh, in a manner so that the sequence of this of, uh, of the newly synthesized repaired DNA is same as that of the donor DNA now. So you have introduced the desired change in the sequence of the DNA. Uh, you have corrected the error in the DNA in this manner. But if it goes for the non-homology or non-homologous end joining type of repair that is called NHEJ repair, it will introduce three types of uh, mutations in that DNA. These mutants are also very crucial. See, if you want to uh, a, a particular gene to be non-functional because uh, it may be so that the, because of that gene a uh, certain kind of disease is being developed and that is that gene is not an essential gene for the organism so you can destroy that gene by this mechanism what happens the double strand break when it goes for repair it either introduces a wrong basis uh, at the point of uh, the digestion uh, at the point of repair so this is called insertion mutation or it may further delete uh, some nucleotide at the place of uh, repair so this will be called deletion mutation or it may alter the sequence suppose there was a t over here and that is being changed to gc so that will be called in substitution mutation so in each of these cases insertion deletion also called indel and substitution you get a mutant version of the dna sequence so this particular dna gene will not be able to produce a functional protein
So this is how uh, the CRISPR-Cas system works and you can use this system in various ways that we will see in our next lecture about the applications of uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system. So thanks for your uh, patient uh, listening to this lecture.